Değerli Distinguished participants, right now I would like to invite Mehmet Şimşek, Deputy Prime Minister, Republic of Turkey, to the floor. Welcome, sir. We are honored. Good morning. Welcome to all of our international participants. I have a presentation. It's in English. So I'll continue in Turkish because probably uh, we have a larger Turkish audience. Um, once again, I'm, I'm delighted to be in Bursa in Uluda and uh, I'd like to congratulate Rauf for putting together yet another excellent summit. I literally arrived pretty late last night from uh, Argentina. I was attending G20 summit I'm pretty tired, as you can imagine. It was almost a 24-hour journey, including the connection via Sao Paulo. So, uh, but I still I can, I can manage to do this presentation and go on and work all day. But anyway, um, at G20, we discussed the future of the world. And uh, the future is bright in the short term, but it has lots of question marks when we move beyond short term. Medium long term outlook are clouded by a number of major challenges. And uh, unless we can work together, I, unless we can have the same spirit that we had back in 2008, when we were faced with a global financial crisis, it may well actually be the case that some of these risks in the medium term materialize. I got carried on in English, but that was my summary. Evet, hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Bir İngilizce giriş yapayım, bir özet yapayım dedim. G20'de dünya ekonomi... G20 meeting, we have spoken the future of the world economy, the outlook of the world economy is quite bright. The world economy is actually growing. The uh, growth is actually below the levels of the financial uh, crisis, but if you take a closer look to the years between 1990 and 2007, actually the growth is over those values. The competition is increasing and the global uh, inflation is under control, and as I said at the uh, short term, the future is bright. Of course, there are certain risks, but the materialization of such risks are quite low. But the mid-term and the long-term risks are quite high. And if we take a closer look to those risks, what we can say? If we exclude a couple of countries uh, like Venezuela, we can say that all the countries and their economies are growing. So we can be speaking about uh, international global uh, growth uh, in a synchronized manner. The synchronized uh, growth periods are not actually lasting long because it actually leads to inflation pressures and the increase in the uh, oil prices and it can also bring about the contraction in the monetary policies and uh, the normalization in the monetary policies. And if you take a closer look to the picture in here, in order to overcome the financial global uh, crisis, the World Banks actually use over 20 trillion dollars of monetary expansion. And a couple of uh, World Bank their balance sheet and their national income ratio is over 40 percent. And this actually leads to a boom in the asset prices. This is a very uh, basic graphic indeed. But this graphic is also showing us that the asset boom is uh, actually uh, growing. The ratio to the GDP is actually booming. And this eventually will translate into a risk. The unemployment rate is decreasing day by day, and this is a good news, actually. But this is actually recovering the global 
output and this means that the inflation will come as well and after the financial global crisis the growth has already initiated but without employment the employment increased but this didn't reflect into the increase in the salaries into the wages but right now the employment is increasing and as a result uh, the wages are also increasing, the salaries are also increasing, and this is a good news for the uh, societies in general term. But we can also say that the monetary contraction, uh, contractionary monetary policies most probably will be implemented. Most probably in the upcoming days, the, you know, uh, the Fed will continue with the uh, contractionary monetary policies they had a meeting very recently and most probably in the near future they will be coming up with those uh, interest rates increase and you can uh, easily see that from this blue line and the expectations for an increase in the interest rates are quite high the geopolitical risks are the other types of risks that we are encountering in the world today as you can see these red areas are the areas in which the conflicts are ongoing in many of the uh, places of the world, we cannot say that the peace is actually existing. There are certain geopolitical tensions and conflicts. But, of course, the biggest risk that the global economy is facing with is the protectionism. Everybody knows 1927. Well, approximately 1,000 precautions, protectionary precautions, lead to the Great Depression and afterwards the Second World War followed. So we are from time to time asking ourselves whether we are on a global trade war. And there are certain implementations which are totally wrong. And this is actually a reality. After the financial crisis, global financial crisis, the protectionism is increasing in the global sense. But right now, there are a certain silent uh, protectionist precautions which are actually not striking attention. But uh, right now, starting from the United States of America, very obviously and very explicitly those protectionist precautions are being taken and this cannot be something good for the global economy because the most important engine of the global economy is trade, international trade and we have to open the pathway for an international trade. Openness to the international trade was quite beneficial not only for Turkey but also to the globe. Billions of people actually uh, got rid of uh, the poverty and they found good health and education opportunities. The average lifespan increased in the world. And we can say that the world in the global sense benefited a lot from the globalization and the openness to the international trade. Of course on certain regions there were certain problems in certain industries there were certain bottlenecks but rather than solving those bottlenecks and problems we actually couldn't uh, we should actually prevent uh, the translation of populism to the protectionism which is actually the result of those financial crisis and in G20 we discussed those topics and maybe if I can exclude one country the other countries were actually on the same mindset as I had in these times we are in need of uh, reforms structural reforms but unfortunately the structural reforms are not uh, actually going on fast in the globe. There is a slowdown in the structural reforms and unfortunately we need those structural reforms these days more than ever. Investments are unfortunately is quite constant, quite stable. Of course the developing countries and their investments are increasing but the blue, blue line is showing us that the ratio between the investments to uh, the national incomes are actually below the levels of 1990s. 
since the investments are not increasing, the productivity is not increasing as well. If the productivity is not increasing, then we cannot be speaking about a permanent welfare. And if you take a closer look to the global productivity, you can see that there is actually a downward trend. And the world is under a huge debt because the debt, the global indebtedness ratio to their national income is approximately 23%. Okay, we don't have any problem these days, but if the interest rates are increasing, then uh, the payment of those debts will be turning into a problem, then you can ask this question to yourselves. The world cannot increase the interest rates permanently and continuously because if we increase the interest rates all the time, then unfortunately the growth will be uh, decreasing as well. The leverage ratio should be reduced these days. And if you take a closer look to the developed countries and the developing countries, then we are actually facing with an important uh, debt problem. And this actually limits the growth uh, of the globe. Starting from 1950s until today, the ratio of the population uh, over the age of 65 increased three points or four points. So the globe is aging, but in the upcoming years, then uh, the ratio of the population over the age of 65 will be going up to 16%. You can say that there is no problem because the uh, artificial intelligence and the robots will bring uh, also welfare to the globe. And you can say that uh, we will be actually having a very uh, welfare life. But we can also say that, especially in the fields of health, we will have important uh, problems. For example, the babies that are born today most probably will be living maybe 120 years or 130 years. And how the states and the governments will be able to uh, satisfy and answer to their health needs. One of the most important messages in G20 was that robots will not actually steal our jobs and will not uh, manage uh, in the globe. Of course, this might be the reality in the short term, but this doesn't actually eradicate the concerns, the social concerns. And uh, in the G20 uh, meeting, the most important theme was the future of work and future of employment. And this aging population is a problem. And injustice, especially in terms of the distribution of the income, is a big problem. And I believe it is the core problem uh, for the other problems that we are encountering with. The rightist governments and the populist governments and the political parties are actually feeding uh, themselves from this injustice uh, and the unequal distribution of the income. And as a result, there is such a popular support for such kind of uh, governments. Uh, and this is actually a huge question mark for the future of the globe. For the short term, the future is bright. For the midterm, uh, there is certain ambiguities. And especially, we can uh, solve those uh, problems. We should come together and we should discuss and we should convince each other. And that's what we have tried to do in G20 meeting. But I'm not sure whether we have been successful or not. Of course, uh, there are certain uh, steps that are taken back for the protectionist precautions. Turkey has grown even faster than the global average. In the last 15 years, Turkey has grown approximately 5.7%. Although there has been many shocks in the region, the terror and the chaos in the Middle East, and also this uh, treacherous military coup attempt, although Turkey has had many problems, Turkey has grown 5.7%. Per, uh, you can say that uh, we have only uh, grown by 
percent more than the average of the Republican period. And this can actually translate into 2.6 uh, times. And if Turkey uh, ha was actually able to grow by 5.7 percent rather than 4.8 percent, then this would actually translate into 2.8 billion dollars of more income. And we can say that excluding China and India, we uh, actually well beyond uh, with comparison to the other countries in terms of the strong relative performance. That's why when you take a closer look to the Turkey, the blue areas in terms of their purchasing power uh, parity, the uh, yellow ones are the uh, countries which are more actually uh, in poverty with comparison to Turkey. And we can say that our purchasing power parity will reach up to 28,000 U.S. dollars. That's why we believe that we actually covered uh, the uh, gap between Europe by 20 points, uh, uh, with the USA 20 points, and 28 per, uh, eight points with the European Union. And within 14 years, if, uh, as the uh, business usual scenario, the Turkey will actually cover the gap with the European Union, and this dream will be a reality in the future. In which terms there was this real convergence, uh, and in which uh, periods uh, we actually uh, had a downward trend, this might be seen from this uh, picture. And we can say that within uh, decades, Turkey actually covered this gap by 3.6 points each decade. And most probably, we will cover the gap even further. And 2018 will be even better. Because last year, Turkey actually uh, finished the year by 7.5 percent and for this year we are expecting a 5.5 percent of growth because the investments will be increasing and the private consumption is strong and the uh, foreign demand is quite strong. The capacity uh, uh, actually usage uh, ratio is quite strong and we are also giving uh, so many uh, promotions for the investments and credit guarantee mechanism was put into force for the investments and the biggest uh, resource are being allocated to the in uh, investments. When you take a closer look to the consumption, uh, you can see that Turkey uh, also has the population of 81 million and uh, if we also include the Syrians and the Iraqi people in Turkey, we can say that the population of Turkey is almost 85 million. So Turkey is actually the country with the highest population rate in the Europe. And uh, in the recent years, Turkey found uh, actually employment for 8.7 million of its people. And the population of the Europe is approximately 512 million, and only 28 countries were able to find uh, employment to 5.2 million of its citizens. And this is actually a great uh, accomplishment for us. The tourism is actually recovering, and the foreign demand uh, to our products are increasing. And the European Union uh, actually is growing as well quite strongly. And this is actually a good news for us, because Turkey actually is in an era in which the local demand and the foreign demand is, is strong, and the tourism sector is recovering as well. Of course, if you grow so strongly, then uh, there will be certain side effects. And this is inevitable, of course. After many years, Turkey, unfortunately, is facing with an inflation problem, which is over 10%. In order to reduce this inflation rate to the single digits, we are actually exerting a lot of effort. And the biggest reason for that is the devaluation of the Turkish lira. As you can see, the imported intermediary products uh, actually increased by 30 percent. And this is the biggest problem. The depreciation 
in the currency is actually related with the economy partially, but it is also partially related with the political developments inside of the Turkey and outside of the Turkey. Because for our right causes, especially, uh, there are certain countries who are against us. And in Syria, for example, we have serious concerns and our allies are not understanding our concerns. And this actually brings about a negative impact, impact to our global trade network. Uh, for this uh, uh, Fethullah terrorist organization uh, who actually uh, committed this military uh, coup attempt, we are fighting with them, but certain of our allies are not understanding the situation and when uh, such kind of events are being reflected to our global trade network this translates into the devaluation in the Turkish lira the food prices are also uh, decreasing and this is actually a good news and we have used tight monetary policies and this was actually uh, an important uh, reaction and in the upcoming years this will work and we are assuming that the Turkish currency will not be depreciated even further and the inflation will be taken under control to the single digits. As the food committee we have also taken many precautions. The most important and the strongest part of uh, Turkey uh, is actually uh, its structural reforms. And the most important reforms, as you remember, uh, was done after 2000, because at the end of the 1990s, the Turkey uh, was at the brink of uh, collapse. Especially, although we have uh, supported the real economy, the uh, government uh, debt was approximately 1.5% uh, because the average for the developing countries is approximately 4.5%. And uh, in terms of the debt, the public finance is quite strong and Turkey can actually react to such kinds of shocks. The banking sector is quite strong. Our capital uh, solvency ratio is uh, quite strong. It is even two times more than the international uh, average. And the actives, uh, the assets quality is quite good. The uh, leverage in the banking sector is quite low as well. One of the uh, uh, most and uh, highest uh, countries in that regard is Turkey. And the profitability rate is approximately 16%, uh, uh, percent, and I believe that this is quite reasonable because the inflation rate is high. One of the most important topics uh, was that the expansion in the credits. And the credit guarantee fund uh, was quite important in that regard. And the credit expansion is actually on the reasonable level. This translates into the decrease in the inflation rates and the current account deficit. And this green line is showing us the credit expansion for this year. In the banking sector, the credit deposit ratio is quite high. And the capital market should develop and you should actually penetrate into the capital markets. In these years, uh, the interest rates are quite low because the global indebtedness is quite high. So the, the interest rates will be increasing and please do not bar off. And if you have to bar off, then you have to go into the capital markets. Why? Because the cost of borrowing will be increasing, but it is not actually on your hands to increase your profit because the competition is harsh. It is not at your discretion and on your hands to control the, your income, but controlling your costs of borrowing is actually at your hands. You have to increase your productivity and being innovative is actually on your hands. Although debt is a triggering factor for uh, the courageous uh, businessmen, uh, but debt might be translating into a problem. In terms of the external debt uh, rollover ratios, we don't have any uh, problems. 
I have spoken about our two strongest uh, parts, banking sector and the public finance, and I said that the inflation was a problem. And the second important problem of us is the current account deficit. Its ratio to our national income is over 5.5%. Uh, this is actually resulting from the import of oil and the gold. But we have to decrease the current account uh, deficit below the level of 3%, and this is possible for the mid and long term. Especially, there is such a close correlation uh, among the current account deficit and the consumer credits. Since the credit expansion has been reduced to the reasonable level, then the, we can say that the current account deficit will be uh, reduced. In the uh, next year, we hope that the current account deficit will be below 4%. Unfortunately, the financement of the current account deficit is not at the quality that we desired. And this actually creates a fragility. And we are so much careful in that regard. Especially in the near term, uh, the reforms will be made for the investments and our relationships will be with the European Union will be improved and our financial resources will be diversified and the IPOs, initial public offerings and the um, privatization will be increased so that we will be able to uh, attract uh, resources from the foreign markets and uh, that's how I hope uh, this uh, situation will be sustainable. Mergers and acquisition in Turkey is increasing and this is a good news. Can we say that Turkey is highly indebted? No, we cannot say this. The, the indebtedness ratio of the Turkey to its national income is 40 to 41 percent. And you have to actually take into the consideration of the public debt. So the average of the public debt is approximately uh, at 28.5%. Uh, and the household indebtedness ratio is 18%. For the financial sector, it is 24%. Only the real sector indebtedness is uh, relatively high. Its ratio to national income is approximately uh, 69%, and the global average is 87%. But of course, we cannot take the global average as an uh, example. So we have to be quite sensible uh, in the real sector indebtedness. And the foreign exchange debt is a huge uh, uh, problem. Uh, uh, actually, the state is not indebted in terms of the foreign exchange. Our assets are higher than our liabilities. And I can, uh, we actually uh, abolish the households to be indebted with the foreign exchange. And this was actually a very good move. The banking sector should be neutral because they can manage this situation uh, with the tools inside of their balance sheet. But our real sector uh, companies and their net position is approximately $230 billion. Uh, they also have assets. I don't want to exaggerate this uh, issue, but this is an important topic. And our companies were quite smart in the short term. They actually accumulated foreign exchange. With the one-year term, our real sector uh, companies do not have net foreign exchange indebtedness. But this actually doesn't eradicate the mid-term problem. So we are taking precautions and what we are going to do. Uh, John F. Kennedy, the United States President, has a saying, and he says that you have to fix the roof and it is sunny. Right now there is growth. Liquidity is quite reasonable. The interest rates might be deemed low. Right now we have to fix our roof because the rain will fall. Maybe tomorrow, maybe in the longer term. But eventually, this global synchronized growth will not be continuing because we had its precedent. The rain will fall. I don't know how uh, severe it will be. Maybe there is going to be a storm. That's why we have to fix our roof from today. And what we, do we do? First of all, we are actually strengthening our macro prudential tools. So what does it mean? We are taking precautions. And for the monetary policy, there is this contractionary monetary policies, and we are in align with that. 
And for the fiscal uh, policies, we have actually a room for maneuvering. And we are at the right, right pathway once again, and our financial uh, policy is quite strong. But the most important topic is the reform, and we have to accelerate our structural reforms. The real sector is not happy, but we have to take precautions uh, Anyway, and they are saying that please do not put any limitation to foreign exchange borrowing because the real sector has a huge gap, has a huge debt. And we actually put some limitation for foreign exchange borrowing to certain uh, SMEs. If you are not exporting and if you are not uh, using your productivity, then we will not allow you to uh, borrow uh, with the foreign exchange. And the big companies, the big companies are saying that we can manage this situation because our financial structure is quite good, they say. But we also see that they cannot manage it. And that's why this panic attacks for the foreign exchange is resulting from, that's why as the state we will take the necessary precautions. We know that the big companies are professional and uh, their uh, institutional structures are quite strong, but we will take our precautions. I have spoken about the monetary policy. For the fiscal policy, what I can say is that pro-cyclical expansionary policy. So you, when you are growing, you are also expanding. And is there a, a reason to support the a fiscal policy because there is no meaning this can translate into uh, procyclical effects and we can actually limit uh, our uh, costs and we can increase our incomes and in order to realize that we have taken certain precautions and we also have a room for maneuvering in the recent months for a long time we were able to do a reform which will improve the investment environment. It was a, a first class quality. New Zealand, as you know, uh, is at the number uh, one uh, place and we can uh, in terms of ease of uh, making business and we actually eased the establishment of the enterprises and the liquidification of the enterprises. There has been very good reforms. I will be speaking about the reform, so I will not go into the details of it. Whenever we have done a reform, we were successful. Whenever we did a reform, then we actually uh, improved in terms of our economic class. And if you want to uh, become uh, actually one of those developed uh, countries, then we have to do reforms and here you see our key reform areas and we are making those reforms uh, among eight and uh, ten different areas our most important priority is the education and we are spending for the education with a comparison to the OECD countries we can say uh, that Turkey is actually spending even more than the OECD global uh, average. And this shows us that the uh, future is bright. And access to the education is increasing as well. And the access of the woman to the uh, education is increasing as well. Because we cannot fly with, uh, we cannot, uh, uh, fly with single handed. So this is actually a good uh, development. We call them STEM programs, science, technology, and mathematics. That, that kind of programs, science, technology, engineering, and uh, mathematics and technology program, the women uh, graduates are well over with comparison to the uh, OECD average, and we have to increase this average. We are improving the quality of our education. We are opening new classes and we are employing teachers. We are investing in teachers and we are investing to uh, actually to the technology as well. And in terms of the education, in terms of the preschool education, we actually want the employment uh, 
and the enrollment of the students before, below the age of three years old. And if you can actually succeed in that, then uh, Turkey uh, will never be caught. And we are also spending to the vocational education, and our target is 60 percent. And the share of the private sector in education is quite low. It is approximately 7.6 percent in Turkey, uh, and in the OECD average is 19.3 percent. And we have to increase this ratio by four times. Investments. In the last 10-15 years, every year, the investments have increased 10% in the real market. Actually, this is showing us that uh, there is an incredible increase in the, in the global market and the profitability has also increased. China, India, and also when we look at those countries, we are higher. However, the construction business is really gaining a great ground. Those successful companies investing to the construction now, would you please invest your money to R&D activities, software, and technology for the future because it is more beneficial. Uh, and on the other side, the mechanics and also industrial and manufacturing businesses are the uh, future fields to be invested because we would like to increase our competitive power. Digitalization is very crucial. This is one of the hot topics. Now in a very low state, but we do have a high pace. This is a good news. Last year we have had a lot of reforms and investments really channeled to this field. As you can see, FID inflows, this graphic really clearly shows the 15 years story. $194 billion of an investment which was being arrived in Turkey and 59,000 companies are now present. We have taken very important steps. We do have a long way to go still. And uh, of course, we would like to be less independent to the foreign investors and we would like to change our focal point. Actually, what we mean to do is, if I go a little bit back, if we focus on some certain areas we achieve. When we look at the defense industry, it was 76% of the defense industry transformed and we do have a decline in our dependency to the foreign sources. It is approximately 32%. Target is 20, below 20%. So if you focus, we are succeeding. Our dependency for the energy was above 60%. However, when we look at last year's figure, it is... Uh, there is the ratio of 50%, more than 50% of localization. So 70% of localization is being objected. And of course, we will be achieving it within five or seven years. In R&D activities, we are not in the place that we are aiming to be, but there is a quadruple increase in the patent applications. We are in the 22nd place. This is not enough. Uh, we need to be in the first 10th place. And when we look at the picture here, I would like to share with you, in this chart, in 1990, middle and over the middle scale type of technological products was only 17%. It's approximately 39% right now. So there is a development. Yes, we are behind Israel. We are behind China. However, we are rapidly transforming our structure. And we would like to trigger this uh, transformation. For the middle-scaled and high-scaled technological products are aimed to be reached to the 65% and we will achieve this. We are moving up to the value chain. We do have well-trained people, well-educated people and supporting also R&D. In innovation, we are at the 43rd place. For the SMEs, uh, I can say that they have become innovative. This is a tweak study and this is a very positive development. On the innovation level, we are on the 19th rank. This is not very bad. In the entrepreneur ecosystem, it, there is a need to be developed. We have done a lot of reforms last year and we will continue them. To be tax restructuring is a very important field. Very soon we will be declaring our digital roadmap. There are a lot of topics. We do have limited time. And also, we need to increase the employment rate. We do have some variance in the front. In order to increase the labor force, the um, contribution, the participation is increasing. The women participation is increasing, but we still do have a long way to go. The biggest problem is the high severance pay. 
in some certain countries of the world, uh, there is no severance pay. Uh, some of them are low. In Turkey, the long working hours uh, can be an explanation to that. Uh, when we look at the manufacturing uh, business, manufacturing industry, we are having a high level, highest uh, hour of shifts. It is very hard to find the employment force, labor force, efficient labor force, so they are extending working hours. And also, there is a low share of part-time employment. The women and the young generation do need part-time employment, and we will be proceeding in the near future. The participation of women is showing a very fast pace. We are one of the highly increasing countries, but still it is low. Uh, of course, the education level is increasing, and the rate of women employment is increasing. We have done a lot of reforms, and in these four areas, we will be focusing in the near future severance pay reforms, enhancing active labor reforms, and so on. And in the law, we do have some reformation acts. When we look at the business case, the completion time of the case is not so good, but not so bad. Enforcing of the contracts is approximately 70%, which is something very positive. When we look at the World Bank's uh, indicators, the quality is increasing in the legal system, and we are beyond the OECD average. We have done a lot of reforms, yes. We have done uh, very uh, ex for example, the judiciary uh, experts and also we do have experts of the courts and uh, for the witness system establishing new appeals courts, modern arbitration systems, specialized courts, reform of bankruptcy, enhancing the electronic notification system are the judicial reforms which will be enhancing the power of justice and will be giving us very positive outcomes. What's next? We would like to expand the specialized course, and we are still in progress. And the second one is the new dispute resolution system. Uh, without going to the case, without going to the course, we will be having mediators between the state and the citizens. And when we look at the public finance, we are having uh, a combat with the unregistered taxation issues. Uh, of course, you know, for the indirect taxes, we have a heavy reliance, and we would like to expand the basis of the taxation. And many reforms are being carried on, and at the moment, the value-added tax is now being negotiated. On the public administration side, we, we are in need of some reforms in the capital market. This is one of our major points. Without developing the capital market, we cannot continue with this pace. To develop the capital market, of course, we need to have a demand and we need to have a supply. The conditions are not suitable. We don't have a storm. We don't have a thunder yet. So our the companies are still open to the public and open it more and have some new partners and finance uh, with more better sources. We will be supporting us as much as we can. If you have any uh, problems, with the capital market and with <coughs> a widely perspective, uh, capital market and stock exchange commission mind, we will be reaching to 82, we, we have reached to 82 percent. Yes, we do have a very robust banking business, banking industry that is very much supportive to our economy. However, when look at the capital market, capital market is also playing a very crucial role. I have a call for the banks. Each of the banks should have a mediator, but this is not enough. And why don't we establish a real means of an investment bank? Come and let, me, let us help you. Please establish investment banks. And from a deposit-based model, please concentrate on the resource-based model for the startup projects, for the future promising investments. Invest them, you will be earning more. Of course, the risk is higher, but the future is awaiting you there. In the traditional business in industries, uh, there is a high level of competition. We are trying to give an aid to those businesses, but for the future promising countries, let's place more sources. And the most important Field is the are the banks. So let's 
the established investment banks. This is my call for the banks. Of course, as you can see, the stock uh, capital market has got a great potential. We have opened the insurance sector, and it is developing, and it will be developing more. And private pension system, it is rapidly developing. There is an incredible success. 11 million participants are having private pension system. And the state is supporting, and we have really collected a huge amount of source, and we will be allocating time uh, to the right places. All of the companies, please tell your sh workers, just uh, save 100 liras and have a private pension system, earn a private pension system, the state will be bringing you 20% and you will be adding 5 or 10% of saving and it will be bringing you a huge amount of income. When you look at the general values of GDP in Turkey, 35% uh, and 40% of an earning will be coming. So private pension will be bringing you a 35-40% of an earning. So the companies, please speak with your employees. Make meetings with your employees and acknowledge them. Make more savings and make uh, create incentives for them to make more savings with the uh, private pensions of angel investing. We are in the fifth place in Europe, treasury facility for funds of funds. We do have 500 million facility waits for applications. Establish your structures, come and manage our structures with 5 million facility, which is awaiting you for your new applications. We are investing for the future. I have extended my speech a lot, I know, but we will be deepening the capital markets. This is the main scope. And, of course, the Turkey ties with the past. We will not be untying our relations. Look at this map. For hundreds of years, we are part of Europe. For hundreds of years, this is the situation. Nobody may exclude Turkey from Europe. Neither Europeans nor us can do this. Because our relations with Europe is very strong. There are some temporary misunderstandings. There are some uh, misconceptions. These are taking place. However, these problems may be resolved. We are never away from Europe. Sometimes they say that we are not in Europe. When we look at the Thrakia region's population, it is 11 million. And this is the blue zone. It is larger than the countries that we are marking on the map. So Thrakian population, that blue zone, many all of the European Union countries, member European Union countries, are not as big as the Thrakian region. So this map is telling a lot of things, actually. You are disrupting the tradition, okay. Uh, but when we come to 1959s, as you can see, we have started a journey, and in this journey, inescapably, it has taken a very long way, and we are having some conflict during this pre-marriage process. So EU needs Turkey, really EU needs Turkey, I'm not joking, on the economical side, about the security side. So in many fields, Europe really in need of Turkey. Of course, Turkey is in need of Europe. Turkey is one of the fifth largest export market in Europe. And the fifth largest trading partner. $160 billion of an export amount that we are speaking about. And the Turkey is the key Europe's in energy supply security. Energy supply security passes through Turkey, and Turkey is the most reliable ally in NATO. One of the most important and strong countries in NATO. We do have the second biggest army, and we are the fourth biggest NATO contributor to UN peacekeeping efforts. So as a result, of course, Turkey, as a reference, as an inspiration, needs Europe. We need to enhance and we need to uh, restructure our legal systems, economical structures, neither in the east or neither in the south. We don't have an inspiration source. European Union is still our inspiration source. In summary, Turkey is the strategic partner of Europe and no one may change this. I do not want to go into details. In the long run, 
the future of the global economy do have some question marks, but our uh, future is very bright. Population. The global population is becoming older. Our generation is still very young. Our population is still very young. For 20 years, if we can extend 5 or 6 percent, we will be catching Europe very soon. Look at the GDP. It is $25 billion with the uh, purchasing parity, income per capita. Rate is that. And when we look at youth population, Turkey's student population is uh, more than the other 32 European countries. 25% of our population is below the age of 15 and 16, by the way. By 2050, we will be the first 20 most populous countries, Syrians and the other populations will be making us to reach 100 million. This is the estimation of United Nations. This is something wrong. It will be most probably 100 million. Our employment amount is low. It will be increasing and we will be enriching. On the participation in labor force is low, it will be increasing and we will be flying. I'm not exaggerating. And these are all in need of reforms. The productivity growth. When we look at the global picture, when we look at the OECD countries, we are in the fourth place. This is very important. Productivity is growing because the investments are increasing. Productivity level is low, but we will be increasing that. We do have three priorities. Infrastructure, R&D, and education. And those three topics will have very rapid developments. The infrastructure we will be developing, we have developed, but we will be developing the railway system and Turkey will be soon becoming the best. We are in the first 30. The infrastructure for the transportation, and according to the World Economic Forum, we are in the first 30 countries. This 30 is a very good number. This is a simple map. I want to show it to you because it is good to know. This is a multi-way roadmap, highway network in Turkey. High-speed railway projects. We are really passing our class for the high-speed train. Really, we are one of the eight countries. And the number of the airports have been doubled. Within the five or six years, we will be completing near airports and every other 100 kilometers, we will be having an airport. This is an incredible success. The ports are the same, logistics are the same. So they are seeing our geography as a burden. We are living in a very hard geography, but it has got a lot of potential. Dal has uh, invested to Turkey, but we do have very robust relations with Balkan countries, uh, Middle East and Africa. We do have very special relations. Investing to Turkey means that investing to a huge geography. Uh, $24 trillion of an investment region. With China, we, have, we are establishing the important Cordain One Road and One Belt Initiative. And the modern Silk Road will be becoming active soon and we will be enhancing our relations with Asia. But energy, Turkey is an energy hub as you all know it very well. Our major topic is the employers. In this hall we do have a lot of entrepreneurs. We really would like to thank them. We are in the 31st place out of 137 countries. We will be supporting them, we will be opening their ways, and we will be fighting with informal economy. Minimum uh, objective is going up to 20 in ranking. And of course, when we look at the government transparency, this is OECD result for 2015. We are not so bad. According to OECD, where are we going to focus? We will be focusing on Africa, we will focus on Asia, we will not be ignoring Europe by 2040. The, we will be doubling our size. Asia and Africa should not be ignored. Brazil, India, China, Russia, Indonesia, Mexico. These are all, we'll be having our presence strongly. 
we do have the 13th place with the PPP and uh, also we do have a grow NCAD by 2050 as you can see for GDP projections we will be over 50 billion dollar actually fifty thousand dollar our perception is bad there is a seen picture and there is a hidden picture which we cannot perceive this is the reality in situation this picture clearly summarizes us the situation our perception is not clear with knee reforms with right applications we can make it crystal clear we can say that you misunderstand us but this will not change anything. We prefer to do more reforms, we prefer to communicate better, and in the very end, the reality of Turkey will be crystal clear. There is no problem uh, in the presence of Turkey, but there is a misconception. I know I have extended my speech a lot, I'm beyond my speaking time, I'm very glad that you're all smiling. I'm not so much pessimistic about the global picture. There are some risks. And for Turkey there are some risks. But if we take our preventive measures, if we get ready for the winter, and the winter is coming, the, win and the seasons are circulating, so we can achieve this. Despite those difficulties, we have created value. Turkey has become rich and we will be creating more value. Actually, why are you all here? This meeting shows us that we can accomplish this. We believe in you. You will be discussing feature. I will be organizing a lot of meetings. And I believe that this will be a very fruitful meeting. In the very background, I would like to thank everyone who have organized this event. I also would like to thank our international guests and I would like to thank the ones who have created a successful event. Thank you very much for listening to me and I would like to apologize for extending my speech.